started. So first of all, hello, Stephanie. Thank you so much for offering this incredible opportunity for our Wayne State students. My name is Valerie Georges, and I am on the service chair committee for Club Med Virtual. I will be leading today's workshop, reading any comments posted in the chat, and facilitating the conversation as we go along. Before we start, I want to remind everyone to maintain proper etiquette and please keep themselves on mute unless Stephanie specifies otherwise. If you have any questions, please post them in the chat and we will address them as we proceed through the session. A Google survey will be administered for Wayne State University students at the very end of the session to verify attendance and will close 30 minutes after the session terminates. Please stay on the call for at least five minutes after the session is over to ensure that the survey is working for you. This session will also be posted on YouTube in case you are unable to attend or want to revisit certain topics Stephanie discusses today, but you cannot receive attendance hours if you are not present in this call and complete the survey. All right, Stephanie, you may begin. Thank you. Um, I don't think we can hear you because you're on mute. Hi, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, amazing, perfect. Um, I was just saying, hope everyone's having a great Tuesday, but um, real quick before we start, if you have any questions, I will always answer your questions as we go. I almost kind of like to answer them as we go rather than at the end. So feel free to just put them in the chat and we'll answer them as we go. Okay, so I'm gonna share my screen with you. Give me one second. Okay, now. Let me put this into a presentation mode. One sec here. All right, so we're talking about blood pressure today. So first off, let's just go over what even is a blood pressure and why we, the purpose of taking a blood pressure in our vital signs. So a blood pressure is essentially every time our heart beats, it's gonna push that blood through our arteries and throughout the rest of our body to circulate all major organs, tissues, everything in our body that needs blood. Inside blood is oxygen. So the purpose of a blood pressure is to see if our tissues and our organs are being oxygenated and perfused correctly. Um, our blood pressure is going to be the pressure of circulating blood against blood vessel walls within the circulatory system. So that's just like the fancier way to explain what blood pressure is. This is going to be one of our five measurements that we take in a set of vitals. So if you are told in clinical or in class or skills lab, whatever, it, to go take a set of vitals, blood pressure is going to be one of them along with your heart rate, your temperature, your oxygen saturation, um, your respirations, and sometimes pain is also included in that as well. So blood pressure is really important. Um, it's expressed as a measurement with two numbers. So the top number is going to be our systolic and our bottom number is going to be our diastolic. So let's just go over what systolic and diastolic even means. Um, how do I click? Here we go. Okay, so our systolic number is our top number. I usually remember this because the top number is the amount of pressure in the arteries during contraction of the heart muscle. So when the heart is squeezing all of that blood through um, the aorta to the rest of the body is our systolic number. So I think systole means squeeze, S for systole, S for squeeze. So that's gonna be your top number of contraction. Our bottom number is our diastolic number. So that's the amount of pressure when our heart muscle is in between beats. And what that means in between beats is when our, we're not contracting, our ventricles have to fill back up with blood, which is that in between relaxation moment of the heart where it fills back up. So essentially what that means is our heart is no longer contracting, we're dilating. So I think diastole means dilate which is gonna be that bottom number and that filling pressure of how much uh, we are filling in our ventricles to pump out during systole. Okay, any questions so far? No questions, I'll keep going. Okay, so <clears throat> we have a couple factors that affect our blood pressure reading. And these are really important because 
we want to make sure we're taking these three factors into consideration um, because if not, we can have a very skewed blood pressure. And this is important to uh, understand if our body's being perfused correctly. Um, and if we have an inaccurate blood pressure reading, we can definitely misdiagnose people. So three factors we wanna look for. Poor hearing is the first one. If you're in a very noisy environment or you're not wearing your stethoscope correctly. So let me actually just show you really quick. I have my stethoscope here. Um, a lot of people will put these in wrong in your ears. And so you're supposed to see how they're curved like this. They're kind of curved this way. I'm gonna put them in my ears. So they're curving towards my front of my face. A lot of people accidentally put them in backwards and you're not gonna hear anything with that. So just make sure you have them on properly. Your environment is quiet. You can hear what you're listening to. Um, second thing, cuff size. Cuff size is a really big thing. There's actually different sizes of cuffs. Um, either for children or adults, even for adults, there's different sizes. There's, there's large ones, there's small ones. So we wanna make sure we're picking a correct size for our patient. Um, too small of a cuff on our patient is going to cause our blood pressure reading to be too high. And that's gonna definitely throw off our blood pressure and we can misdiagnose people with that too large of a blood uh, cuff on our arm means our blood pressure readings are going to be too low. Um, so if we put on a blood pressure cuff that's too tight or too small and we inflate that, our blood pressure is, is going to be so high because we're so constric constrictive on our arm. And then in the opposite, if we put too large and we inflate it, it's not gonna do any type of constriction to our arm because it's so big on our arm. Okay, last thing is patient positioning. Um, we're always told to kind of keep the arm relaxed when we're taking a blood pressure. We don't want to dangle the arm down below the bed or wherever you're taking this blood pressure at because our blood pressure reading may become too high, which means um, if we're dangling our arm and our blood is circulating to that extremity that is dangling, we're getting more of a rush of blood to that extremity, which is gonna cause a skewed blood pressure and it's gonna become high because more blood is rushing to that extremity. On the opposite, if we have um, our arm above our heart level, so if I'm taking a blood pressure with my arm kind of like this or above my heart at all, our readings can become too low. And the reason is because if I have my arm above heart level, I'm not perfusing, the, the blood is going to actually rush back down to the center of my body. Um, so if I put the cuff on the arm that the blood is rushing back to the center of my body, there's not going to be any type of pressure going on there. So our readings will be very low. So we want to make sure that our arm is really relaxed, sitting on the bed, sitting on your lap, something not tense, um, so we get a really accurate reading. Okay, next one. Okay, so where do we auscultate? In a blood pressure, we are looking for the brachial artery. The way I think about this is if you look at your hand, when I'm trying to find the brachial artery, I use my pinky as my point of reference. I draw a line from my pinky to pretty much your elbow, the antecubital fossa in your elbow. So down here, and it's gonna be because you're on your pinky side, that is medial to your body. Whereas if I'm looking for the radial artery, I would draw a line from my thumb to locate the radial artery, which is on the lateral side. So in blood pressure, we're using the brachial artery. I'm gonna follow my pinky all the way to where I get into the general area of the elbow. And I'm gonna palpate for my heart rate or my heartbeat. When I palpate that, that is where I'm gonna be placing my stethoscope when I take this blood pressure. Um, when we take a blood pressure, and I'll get to this more into detail in a second, we're looking for something called carotid cough sounds, which is pretty much our blood flow sounds, our systolic and our diastolic that we're gonna label them when we are actually listening to our um, blood flow when we put the blood pressure cuff on. So in terms of auscultating, we're looking for the brachial artery and we're going down to the elbow and trying to find a heartbeat right there in the medial area. All right, next. Okay, 
So blood pressure, the reason we're, we even are looking at blood pressure is because we want to look for the range that it's in. We have a normal range, which is what our goal is. Normal range is gonna be 120 over 80. That's, an, that's like our, our classic 120 over 80 we hear all the time is our normal for blood pressure. That means that our major organs are receiving enough blood and yes, we have enough oxygen because if we're getting enough uh, blood, we're getting enough oxygen. Now, if we have too low of a blood pressure, that's termed hypotension. Hypo means low, low blood pressure. Anything less than 90 over 60 is gonna be termed hypotension. What this means is if my body is hypotensive, if I'm hypotensive, that means that my heart is not perfusing my body with enough blood to my major organs, which means I'm not getting enough blood and I'm not getting enough oxygen to these major organs. In terms of signs and symptoms, we want to think about, if we think about the patho behind that, um, if I'm not getting enough blood to my major organs, which means I'm not getting enough oxygen, all of my signs and symptoms are gonna be related to that deficiency in oxygen. So I'm gonna see dizziness and fainting because I'm not getting enough oxygen to my brain. I'm gonna see fatigue because I'm not getting enough oxygen to my muscles. Nausea, again, with the, uh, the brain, blurry vision, um, cool and clammy skin. So that is, if I'm not perfusing to my distant, my distal extremities, um, these are going to be more cool than my core temperature is going to be normal, but my distal extremities are going to be more cool and clammy. I might have some shallow breathing or a weak and rapid pulse. So you would think sometimes people get confused with this pulse aspect because if you think if my blood pressure is low, why is my heart rate going to be rapid then? And that's what we call a compensatory mechanism that if my blood pressure is low, my heart thinks, oh, I need to pump faster to get more blood to these major organs. So to compensate for this low blood pressure, my heart will become more rapid. Even though it's weak, it will become more rapid because it's trying to compensate for hypotension. Now, on the other hand, we have something called hypertension. This is divided into four stages and we'll go over that in a second. Um, hypertension is the force of blood against the artery walls and that it's too high due to a multitude of reasons. Um, if our blood pressure is too high, we actually, it's kind of weird because the signs and symptoms for hypertension, we actually go, it goes unnoticed for quite some time, which is why it is termed the silent killer. Um, because there's not many signs and symptoms that are specific to hypertension. We may see headaches or shortness of breath or something um, of that nature, but these are not specific to hypertension. So we cannot say that that is a specific sign and symptom of hypertension because it could be anything really. Um, if this goes unnoticed, we usually don't treat it because we don't know it's there. And then that is when it causes a multitude of health conditions, heart diseases, strokes, stuff like that. So we really wanna make sure that um, we get, when we start to get older, we do get routine um, blood pressure checks or just go in for like annual physicals to make sure that we don't have some sort of hypertension um, that might be underlying that we don't know is there. Okay. So I included on the left a little chart of um, the stages of hypertension. Now these two, the elevated and the high blood pressure stage one, depending on your school, some of these ranges will vary. Um, in this picture, elevated and high blood pressure stage one can both be considered prehypertension. Anything above 140 systolic or 90 or higher is gonna be when you get into hypertension and then you can go into hypertensive crisis. So depending on your school, they may have this type of um, same like chart where you go from normal elevated then to stage one and stage two or elevated stage and stage one can be considered the same thing at some places. Okay, so our normal we know is 120 over 80, which is this blue. This is great, we love being in the normal. If we're a little bit elevated, we're at risk for hypertension, which means AKA pre-hypertension. 
in order to treat this, usually all we have to do is to change our lifestyle habits. If we live healthy lifestyles, um, we can normally just get our blood pressure back into that normal range and it'll stay there. Same with stage one, AKA also prehypertension usually, or you can just call it stage one. Um, treatment for this is usually healthy lifestyle again, which will make your blood pressure go back to normal. But if that is not sufficient enough, we can start using blood pressure medication. Now, the where you should, if you remember anything from this chart, just remember 140 or higher is usually when we term hypertension. And this may vary, the number may vary between schools, but usually it's either 140 or 150, 160, one of those. Um, in order to treat this, we always, always, always recommend lifestyle changes, but we also in hypertension, we want to start those uh, cardio meds. We need blood pressure medications to lower that blood pressure and keep it there. Um, if we have been diagnosed with hypertension, we want to make sure that we do follow-ups to make sure that the blood pressure medications are working and you know our lifestyle is, is um, changing and we're improving that blood pressure because like before, if we don't um, treat this or if it's long-standing, we can do some major damage to some organs, our, our brain, our heart, all of those. So then we get into a hypertensive crisis, and this is when our blood pressure is above 180 systolic or 120 diastolic. This is very high. We want to make sure if we have a patient that we take their blood pressure and for some reason it's in this range, we're going to check it again because we want to really make sure that this is actually real. Hypertensive crisis is a medical emergency. Um, it's pers if it's persistently high, we need to contact our healthcare provider or go to the doctor or something to get it checked out. If we have some type of chest pain, shortness of breath or vision problems, that's even worse. So we really want to make sure we get our blood pressure in check so we don't end up in this hypertensive crisis. All right, I keep going here. Okay, causes. So back to our three charts here, normal. Goal 120 over 80, major organs are being perfused. This is great. If we go to hypotension, if we think about the patho that we just talked about, if I'm in, if I have hypotension, that means that my body is not circulating enough fluid throughout my body. I have low uh, blood pressure, so I'm not getting enough blood to my major organs. Reasons that this may happen is bradycardia. Bradycardia is a low heart rate. If you think about low heart rate, that means we're not gonna be pumping enough blood throughout the body or slowly throughout the body, body and that can cause hypotension. Um, fibrillation usually, because our heart is, that's a dysrhythmia of our heart that will make it quiver. So if we're quivering and not actually forcefully contracting, doing a full contraction of our heart to pu pump that blood, then um, we can have hypotension as well. Now, one of the classic things is, um, anything that causes hypovolemia or low volume of blood or fluids in the body. Some of these things include hemorrhage patients, patients who are hemorrhaging, anyone who has severe diarrhea or excess vomiting. All of these are gonna cause a low volume of fluid in our body, which can cause hypotension. So a big loss of fluid is a major one for hypotension. Um, in terms of medications, diuretics, because if we go back to our fluid, if I'm diuresing a lot of fluid from my body and I diurese myself too much, that means I'm putting too, uh, or getting rid of too much fluid from my body and I can put myself into hypotension. Cardio meds usually are blood pressure medications. If we have too much or we're taking too much of them, we can get too low, which is hypotension. Narcotics, we all know coming out of surgery, um, narcotics can affect our respiratory rate, our heart rate, our blood pressure. So we wanna make sure with di uh, narcotics. And then vasodilators. Um, vasodilators is a, essentially if I'm taking a medication that's gonna dilate my blood vessels which is going to help, say I have hypertension, I'm taking a vasodilator or something, I'm dilating my blood vessels. That means I'm putting less pressure in that tiny, narrow blood vessel. It's going to dilate, right? So um, if I'm doing this, that means there's less pressure and my blood pressure is gonna go down. So we wanna watch for hypotension for those. 
And then we have any type of um, structural disease to the heart. So um, any cardiac tamponade, valve disease, ischemic heart disease, any of those, that's not gonna efficiently be able to pump our blood through the rest of our body it can cause hypotension. If we look at hypertension, some type of causes are, a lot of them are going to be lifestyle factors. If we drink excess alcohol, lack of exercise, um, a poor diet or high salt intake, we are causing our body to overwork itself with all of these poor lifestyle factors, which is going to cause hypo, hypertension as a rebound effect. Um, same with obesity or smoking, cardiac conditions again, and then endocrine disorders as well. Okay. Now, so I'm actually going to demonstrate this right now. I'm, I have my dad here who is going to be my patient. So come on in here and you sit. So I have my stethoscope and I have a blood pressure cuff. So I'm going to explain to you the pieces of this blood pressure cuff and how I'm going to put it onto my dad's arm. But pretty much we have this, which is our, um, what I'm going to look at. I'll show you right here. What I'm gonna look at, it usually comes separated from this little hook right here. You can put it on the hook, you can hold it. I personally feel like um, I'm holding a lot of things when I'm doing this, I'm turning the cuff, I'm listening with the stethoscope, so I keep mine attached. Um, again, we want to place this. So what I'm gonna first do, actually, before I even place this, is I'm going to palpate for the brachial artery. So if I'm palpating the brachial artery, let me have your arm really quick. And again, we would, I'm gonna turn this down. There we go. Okay, if I'm palpating for the brachial artery, I'm gonna follow his pinky right here all the way up to the general area of the elbow. And I'm gonna take my two fingers, three fingers, whatever you wanna do, and I'm gonna follow this up and, and palpate till I feel the beats of his heart. Let's see if I can feel it. Okay, so right here is where I feel it, which is pretty medial to his body and um, right in the area, the antecubital fossa right here. So this is gonna be my point of reference where I'm gonna put my stethoscope, my diaphragm of my stethoscope onto his, his arm. So I just wanna make a note that this is the general area I'm gonna put it in. Okay, so then I have my blood pressure cuff. We want to put our blood pressure cuff on the arm with the arrows, there's little arrows right here, the arrows facing downwards. So it's gonna look like this when it goes on his arm. So I'm gonna put it on his arm and I want, I'm looking at this on his arm. So I want this to be facing me. So I'm gonna put it on his arm. And when I put this on a patient, one of the best things to do to make sure you don't have it too tight or too um, loose is you want to be able to stick one finger in between his skin and the blood pressure cuff. And if it's snug, it fits perfectly in there. That's a good um, tightness on his arm. If it's too loose where I can put more than one finger in there, we wanna tighten it. And if, it's, if I can't even fit a finger in there, we wanna loosen it because it's way too tight and we're not gonna get accurate readings. So once I do this, I have my little pump right here. Sorry, this is gonna move a little bit. Okay, so I have my little pump right here. People always forget, we need to turn this pump because if I keep it to the left and I pump, 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 nothing is going to happen. Nothing is going to fill because this is not tight. So I need to turn this to the right all the way that I can. Okay, now it's ready. I'm going to put my stethoscope in my ears. I'm only going to put one in so I can hear myself. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to put my stethoscope in my ears, place the diaphragm of my stethoscope over that general area I noticed before, which is going to be right over the medial aspect of the elbow. I can hear his heartbeat in my stethoscope and I'm going to inflate the cuff till I get to around 140-ish. You really can do higher or lower. I've noticed the higher I go, the more kind of painful it is for the patient. So I go around 140 and then I'm going to start, I'll actually do it and show you. You probably can't see it too well in the video, but I'm gonna do it around 140 and then I'm gonna start to release it very, very slowly. And what I'm looking for when I do this is something called the Karatkov sounds. It's gonna be two sounds that I'm looking for. The first sound is going to be the first thump that I hear. Did it loosen? Okay, cool. I don't wanna like suffocate your arm. Um, okay, so the first sound that I hear, that first thump, 
And if you are looking at this little thing, I can take it off now. Okay. If you're looking at this little dial, usually the first thump that you hear is going to be the first uh, time that you see this little dial right here kind of dip it a little. It's gonna, you're gonna release the air and it's gonna go down, 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 and then it's gonna kind of dip it. And that's gonna be your first Karotkov sound, which is your systolic blood pressure, that top number. Then we're gonna listen, 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 listen. It's gonna get lower, lower, lower. And then you're going to see a moment where the divots kind of stop in this dial. It's gonna divot, 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 all the way down till we reach the second Karakov sound, which is our diastolic sound. And that's gonna be when the dial just kind of releases. There's no more divots. It's gonna be that last kind of thump sound that we hear um, in our stethoscope. So that's pretty much it. So we're gonna, so let's just look over this key. Thank you for participating. Okay, so we're gonna look over this key really quick just to make sure I didn't miss anything. So we draw a line from the pinky to the ante antecubital fossa. Um, this is our point of reference. We're gonna take our cuff, place it over the arm. We wanna make sure it's not too tight, not too loose. Um, then we're gonna turn the bulb to the right. Don't forget about the bulb because a lot of people forget about that. And they're like, why is it not, why is it not um, inflating? Okay, then we inflate the cuff. We're gonna slowly deflate it and look in here also, look in here for those thumps that we're gonna see with that dial going down. The first thump we see is gonna be our systolic pressure. The last thump that we see in here is going to be our diastolic pressure. Okay, now, that's, so now I just have some memory recall questions for you. Um, there's five different questions. And if you want to, you can maybe put in the comments of this and we can look at the comments to see um, if you get them right. We can do that that way. Okay, I'll read them out loud. When auscultating for Karotkov sounds, what is systolic pressure indicated by? The first detection of the sounds, so the first thumb, or the disappearance of the, th the sounds, so that last thump. Is it A or B? I'm gonna look at the chat here so I can see it as well. Yay, perfect. Okay, everyone's saying A. Yes, exactly. So our systolic pressure is our top number, systolic squeeze. So that's gonna be our first sound that we hear. Diastolic is going to be um, dilate, which is gonna be our last sound, our relaxation of our um, heart. Okay, let me go on to the next one. So you got that right. What would you expect? Let me move this. Can't see here. Um, what would you expect a blood pressure reading uh, for the arm raised above the head? Higher than a reading measured within the arm in its normal position. Oh, it already went to the answer. You guys already answered it. <laughs> okay, great. Yeah, so if I put my arm above my head and I am trying to get my patients, um, if I'm trying to get my own blood pressure reading and my arm is above my heart, all of that blood that's in my arm is just gonna leave. It's just gonna rush back down. So I'm not gonna get an accurate reading. It's gonna be lower than what um, I want it to be. So we wanna make sure our arm is um, relaxed. It's not too high, not too low, not dangling. It's just chilling on the bed or wherever you're taking this blood pressure. Okay. Next question. The term systole and diastole usually refer to blank and blank, respectively of the blank. So either contraction, relaxation, the ventricles, relaxation, contraction of the ventricles. Great. Okay. So I'm seeing a lot of A answers. Yes. So systole is uh, our squeezing in our contraction. Diastole is our dilating or our relaxation of the heart. And these have to do, we're looking at the ventricles here because that is what we're, what is going to be pumping out of the heart, right? Good job. Okay, the numbers in a blood pressure reading vary depending on the time of day your blood pressure is checked, get lower with high level stress or are the same uh, for people of the same age and weight. 
Yes, I am seeing a lot of A's in there too. Great job. So yeah, it's going to vary depending on the time of day your blood pressure is checked. Um, when we have high levels of stress is usually when we see high blood pressure. So we're not going to have a lower blood pressure, a hypotensive blood pressure. We're going to see a higher one with stress. Um, and then blood pressure is not the same for people of ages and weights. They're always going to vary no matter how young or how old we are that, and even our weight too, is going to play a big factor in what our blood pressure is going to be. So the answer is a great job. Okay. A patient returns to, let me see if I can move this. Perfect. A patient returns to the clinic for a routine blood pressure follow-up. She states that she was previously diagnosed with prehypertension. Which blood pressure reading would we expect to find in this patient? Prehypertension. Remember that. Okay, I'm seeing mixed answers of A and C. So we want to make sure that we know the, um, the, the minimum level to be classified as hypertension. And the minimum level is 140. So 140, exactly. Someone said 140 is high blood pressure. Yes, exactly. So 140 is going to be considered hypertension. Usually this varies for different schools, but 140 is the lowest I've ever seen it go. Usually sometimes people classify it as 160 or whatever, but um, 140 is considered hypertension. Pre-hypertensive is going to be 120 systolic to 139 systolic. So if we look at answer A, pre-hypertension, that systolic number fits right in there. And then if we look at answer B, this is going to be pretty close to normal. 120 over 80 is our normal, so that's, that's pretty close. Um, okay, so our answer is A. C is going to be your hypertensive. A is going to be pre-hypertension. Pre see if I can. All right. And a patient's blood pressure reading is 142 over 96. What range would this fall under? So remember what I said, how some of these stages can be classified as the same thing. So I see a lot of you picking B, but rethink your answer potentially because sometimes prehypertension and stage one can be classified as the same thing. Usually it's up to that 140 range, 139 range. So if a patient's blood pressure is 142 over 96, that's going to be stage two hypertension. And I'll go ahead and I'll go back to the, um, the uh, chart that I put up so I can show you guys the actual. Yes, exactly, because it's above 140. 140 is pretty high for that systolic number. The higher we get, the, the, the higher stages we're gonna go through. So we're already, if we're at stage one with our other question of a patient um, who had a 132 blood pressure systolic reading, 142, we're going to keep going up. We're at stage two now. We're not at stage one anymore and definitely not prehypertensive because that's, that's not um, too alarming. All right, stage two. And is this for any age? Usually this is, um, I, when I just wrote these questions, I was just thinking of adults, but uh, I'm sure it's going to change for children or um, maybe like elderly people, but this is just for adults. So higher than 140 is stage two. Yes. So let me go back really quick. I'm going to go back to the, this one right here. Okay. So see stage two right here is 140 or higher. This is considered hypertension. At some schools, elevated, which is our prehypertension, and stage one of this high blood pressure can be meshed into one, or you can look at them separate, depending on however you learned it. Um, hypertension, regardless though, is going to be 140 or higher for sure. Any other questions? And then hypertensive crisis, we definitely don't wanna get there. That's a 180 systolic or a 120 diastolic. All right, great. That was all of the questions that I had. I believe that's it, yeah. We had a few questions that were asked in the chat before the memory game. Yeah, sure. Um, so when you were talking about the arm being relaxed and on your lap, someone asked, is this similar to as why people are told to keep their feet flat on the floor? 
Yeah, I think so. And usually a lot of times too, they'll tell you don't cross your legs or um, just keep your legs as relaxed as possible too. And I think that's because we, if we cross our legs or, or we're restricting that normal blood flow, if I, if I don't have my feet flat on the fo floor um, or I cross my legs or something like that, I'm restricting those blood vessels in my legs, um, which is gonna cause an alteration in that blood pressure. And we don't want any type of alteration. We wanna get a really accurate reading. So we're gonna keep our body relaxed, our arm really relaxed too, because that's what we're measuring. But yes, our legs do play a role in it as well. Um, someone else asked, the normal range could also vary depending on our age too, correct? And then yes. to kind of add on to that, someone else add, asked, would athletes have different normal heart rate ranges? Yeah, and that's a huge um, test question that I got. I remember in nursing school was sometimes um, I would be given in a, in a test question, I'd be given a patient who was an active runner or an active, uh, an Olympic athlete or something like that, some type of athlete, a football player, whatever. Um, and usually with athletes, we will always see a lower heart rate. And, a, and I would assume, I'm not too sure exactly with the blood pressure. I'm, I would assume if we have that lower heart rate, we have that lower blood pressure. And that's just because they're trained that way, um, that that's just their exercise level and how their physiologic body is with, um, with training at that high intensity level that the body now kind of lowers its blood pressure because it doesn't need as much to pump through. Um, yeah, that's, I am not too sure exactly too much on the blood pressure, but I know for sure the heart rate will lower. And if we think about the patho, I'm, I would assume that if our heart rate is lowering, our blood pressure is gonna lower as well. Uh, is it difficult to treat hypotension? So hypotension, one of the first things that we are gonna do in treating hypotension is we wanna identify the cause. Um, because if we looked back at the causes um, that I had listed, some of them were a hemorrhage or um, severe dehydration in some sense. So severe diarrhea or severe vomiting or something. So we want to identify the cause and then we're going to treat that cause because when we treat that cause, then it's going to alternatively treat our blood pressure. Um, so for instance, if I had a patient who was hemorrhaging I'm for sure going to give some type of fluids to the patient uh, because if I have a low volume of fluid in my body, I'm gonna get a low um, blood pressure. And the way to improve that is to increase the volume. And to increase the volume, I'm gonna give fluids to my patient. So I think um, hypotension, it's not like difficult to treat, you just have to identify the cause and figure out what to do in that sense with that. Another question was, uh, what if a patient's systolic number is 180 while the diastolic is 80? 180 over 80, is that, was that the um, yeah. numbers? So let me reshare my screen really quick so I can show you this thing. Um, and I'm sure every school is going to have their chart that they reference. But for instance, in this one, if we look at this and an or, if we have a systolic of 180 and or above 120, so that means both of them don't have to be above. So if I have a systolic of 180, I'm definitely going to think hypertensive crisis, even though my diastolic might just be 80. Hopefully that answered that one. Someone else asked, if a patient has already been on meds for hypertension in their early 20s, is that damage irreversible? Oh, I do not, I'm not too sure. If the patient has been on meds already, is the damage irreversible? I don't, um, I don't know if I would say it's irreversible. Um, I think with any type of hypertension, you are causing a little bit of damage in general to the vessels of your, or your 
your organs or yeah, really anywhere, mainly your heart. But, um, and I don't think there's a way to just reverse that. But if you catch hypertension early enough, you can prevent it from getting, uh, from causing too much damage, which is good. So if you're on blood pressure uh, medications in your early twenties, that's, that's good to identify it early. So then you're not having this hypertension longstanding for a, a good majority of your adulthood. And then you start to see all these symptoms later on in life because you never treated it early on. So I don't know about like being irreversible, but yeah. Someone else asked, are automated machines commonly used in hospitals and clinics as accurate as this method that you showed us today? So um, I don't think automated machines are as accurate as doing it yourself, because when you're doing it yourself, you are physically doing this and hearing it yourself. Whereas automated, anything that's automated in general, we don't know if it's going to always be accurate every single time, which is why sometimes we'll see blood pressures um, automated be taken more than once because we want to make sure uh, of the reading that it's telling us. But I think in any situation, to get the most accurate reading is you doing it yourself, you seeing and you hearing this yourself rather than um, an automated machine. And I always thought about this in nursing school too, was why are we learning how to take this blood pressure if we, when we get into the hospital, we're gonna have these automated machines, but you have to think some, first off, some hospitals don't have automated machines. So you have to know how to take this blood pressure yourself. Um, if a automated machine breaks, you have to know how to take it yourself as well. If it's inaccurate, you wanna know how to take it yourself too. And some floors don't have automated machines at all. So we, we take them ourselves too. So it's important to know, um, yes, how to read those automated machines, but also it's so vital to, to know the actual skill of taking blood pressure just in case something happens. I agree. Um, someone else said, what are some ways we can keep a healthy blood pressure during college? Ooh, um, I would definitely think it's all about that lifestyle factors. I feel like it's a huge um, thing, especially when we're young, we're setting ourselves up for, you know, the health of our adulthood. And I think that um, just really focusing on proper diet and exercise, smoking and alcohol are obviously not great things for really anything in our body. So that, um, just being aware of that. And especially in nursing school, I think that we sit for a very long time. We're really sedentary, um, studying or especially in Zoom now and whatever. So I think just uh, really paying attention to how like sedentary your lifestyle is and then kind of doing things to be proactive and um, fix that, whether it be like your diet or going out for exercise um, you know, in between classes or just taking a break and something like that, but getting yourself moving and improving your lifestyle factors will definitely help um, your blood pressure and overall body just in general as you get older. Is it possible to have a high heart rate and high BP or will the heart always compensate? No, you can definitely have a higher heart rate, high BP, definitely. What are the risk factors for stage one hypertension? Risk factors, let me um, make sure I don't lead you in the wrong way. Um, nursing school notes. Um, risk factors for stage one. I would say your risk factors, because that is pretty early, would be like probably those lifestyle factors again, because usually when this happens, it, um, if, if we're catching it early, it's going to be that early, those early signs of damage. And those early signs of damage usually occur with our lifestyle factors, our stress, our obesity, our diet, um, lack of exercise, stuff like that. So I think if all of those can be risk factors, and then as we get to higher stages, we have more risk factors. Whatever, whatever those risk factors do to our body are gonna produce new risk factors for the next stage, which will produce new risk factors for the next stage and so on. Someone said, does food intake impact BP levels, which I think you kind of covered, yeah. like eating fatty so food? Salt. And build up yeah. back and artery district blood flow, so that affects the pressure of blood. 
Yeah, definitely. So fatty foods, salty foods, salty foods, those are um, ob obviously never good for the body. So we try to um, limit those type of foods, but you're correct. So when we talk about like diet and lifestyle and stuff like that, that's always going to play a factor in um, the effectiveness of our heart in general. Um, that that plaque buildup, the atherosclerosis that um, we will see from all of this fatty buildup of um, fatty deposits in our heart is going to be caused by this poor diet, this, these poor last lifestyle factors, this increased sodium and stuff like that. So if we really reduce those, we're reducing that risk of the fatty buildup, which is going to reduce our risk of getting these cardiac um, problems later on. Someone else asked, so if the diastolic is above 120, but the systolic is normal, that's also considered a hypertensive crisis, correct? So 120 is not, um, oh, if the diastolic is above 120, I believe so. According to this chart that I am using, but this is going to be different anywhere you go. So whatever your school is teaching you for hypertensive crisis, um, usually we'll look at the systolic first and then we'll look at the diastolic. But um, in this chart, it's either and or or. So we either have uh, 180 and uh, higher than a 120 or we have one or the other. Someone else said, I originally thought that using a vasodilator would widen the blood vessel, causing a lower blood pressure. Am I thinking about it wrong? Can you explain? No, you're correct. And that was in my slides too. So hypotension is that lower blood pressure. And one of the reasons, one of the causes we can see this is if we're taking vasodilators. Usually when we have um, some type of high blood pressure problem, well, we can get, we can take a vasodilator along with our other low blood pressure or um, blood pressure reducing medications to lower that blood pressure. And essentially what a, when we have our, our vessels, they're like this. And if we have hypertension, hyper, so high, that means our blood vessels are really narrow. So that force of pressure in between this blood, these uh, walls of the vessel is gonna be really high where we have to push really hard to get through this narrow space. So if I'm dilating my blood vessels, I'm relaxing that amount of pressure in that blood vessel, which is gonna lower my blood pressure because now it's able to free flow um, a lot. We don't have to use as much force to push through these dilated vessels. That makes sense. Do mental illnesses such as depression, bipolar, schizophrenia, et cetera, affect blood pressure? Oh, um, do mental illnesses, I'm, I would, maybe say, I'm not too sure exactly. I don't want to steer you in the wrong direction with this one, but the first thing that comes to my mind is um, the aspect of stress. And so if any of these type of mental illnesses have, you have a lot of stress in your body that can affect your blood pressure and causing it to raise, but I'm not too sure exactly if um, mental illnesses affect blood pressure, like if there's specific ones that will affect blood pressure. Blood pressure. Someone else said, I have been told that placing certain fingers on the diaphragm of the stethoscope can lead to inaccurate readings. Is that true? I've actually been told that too. Personally, I've never ever thought about that when I am um, auscultating anything with my stethoscope. I usually just hold it literally like this, just right on to the edges right here. But I never even heard that until I was out of nursing school and never once in nursing school did I have an issue with it. So um, I've seen people hold it like that. I've seen people hold it like that. Um, I've seen people put their finger right here, but I, I'm really not too sure if there's like a, a difference in that. I usually just hold it like this and I don't have an issue with it, so. Does hard and loud pounding of the heart have something to do with high blood pressure levels? Yeah, so um, if we have a really, if we have a high blood pressure, we're going to have bounding, what we call bounding pulses, which means if I were to uh, palpate 
my say jugular vein or something or my arm i'm gonna feel these bounding pulses this really um how do i explain it this really big kind of like thump right on my fingers that i'm palpating with that's termed bounding so that's a, a high blood pressure because we're we are um really pushing our body is really pushing that blood through our our vessels which is going to be a lot of force and i'm going to feel that in my fingers someone else asks is the white coat syndrome true that people's blood pressure goes up when they see a doctor it is true. I've had a lot of patients who have white coat syndrome and they actually do. Actually, when I um, when I used to work at an urgent care before I even was in nursing school, I a lot of patients would come in and patients inevitably get nervous in doctor's offices or when doctors enter the room. And always when a patient comes into the room, first you take their blood pressure or not even the blood pressure, you take all of their vitals, right? And um, every single time, there's, we usually have to retake the blood pressure because they get, patient, patients get nervous and um, white coat syndrome is real. And I always used to see that when I was um, working at urgent care and I was like, wow, I never really knew what white coat syndrome was until I actually saw it in a clinical setting. Um, but yeah, it's a real thing and it can definitely affect your blood pressure. Someone else said, would it be possible for the body to get used to a BP medication or another medication and then it stopped working? Like, would it be possible to replan because of an abused medication since the body may be used to it? Yeah, totally. I think that with any medication you take, your body can get used to it or it might become ineffective after a while. So that's why when we have these patients that have hypertension or diagnosed with hypertension, they co go in for routine follow-ups for this hypertension because we want to make sure that our prescribed medication that we are, are given and are using is still working effectively. And sometimes we might have to change it. Sometimes we'll increase the dose. Sometimes we'll decrease the dose. Um, but yeah, definitely. This all, I think with any, any type of medication you're giving, we can get, um, we can become resistant to it or immune to it. So we always want to be checking, especially with our hypertensive patients, that they just get routine follow-up to make sure that their um, dose is good still for their hypertension. I believe this is our last question. If anyone else has any questions, please feel free to leave them in the chat. But someone said, how can you treat those hard, loud pounds of the heart? What do you mean hard, loud pounds? Like the bounding pulses? Is that I'm assuming? I think so. I think they're going back to what you were just talking about. The bounding? Yeah. Um, so really, we're not treating the bounding pulses. We're, we, the bounding pulses is just a characteristic of some underlying cause that's inside, that's going on inside, right? So we don't really necessarily treat bounding pulses. We will treat the hypertension, which will then in turn lower those bounding pulses to be normal again. Um, same if we had in the opposite, if we don't have bounding pulses, we'll have weak and thready pulses, very weak and faint pulses that we'll hear. And we're not necessarily going to be treating weak pulses. This is a sign of low fluid volume in our body. So we would be treating the low fluid volume, volume, which would improve that weak pulse to become normal again. Okay, I think we can wrap things up. So thank you. Thank you so much for the incredible and insightful session. I personally really enjoyed it and especially yeah. how interactive and encouraging you were. I'm yeah. sure everyone else feels the same way. We hope to have a session with you again in the future. And if you would like to post your social media handles yeah. or links to your business endeavors, I know you have some really great study yeah. um, tools and resources. You can post those in the chat. Um, to all of our Wayne State members, we do have a survey it's linked in the chat. Please make sure you complete the Google survey posted and to do that to receive your attendance points. And thank you all. I hope you all have a wonderful night. And thank you again, Stephanie. We really appreciate yes, it. Yes, of course. I'm going to leave my handles on here really quick. I'm just going to explain them for anybody who is curious. I'm going to put my Instagram on here. If you have any questions, uh, just throughout 
nursing school in general, I will always answer questions. So you can always message me on Instagram, I'll answer. I do do daily quizzes, uh, random nursing questions on my uh, Instagram stories that they're fun, you would like them. And then I am gonna drop my TikTok. On my TikTok, I do 60 seconds of knowledge. So I teach different topics, various topics in nursing school in 60 seconds. And then I also am gonna leave my Etsy shop as well. In both my Instagram and my TikTok, you can click the link in my bio for both of them and it'll bring you to my Etsy. And I sell all different types of nursing study sheets that are super brief and um, really get straight to the core of what you need to know in nursing school. And it just gets rid of all the fluff. So I'm gonna leave all that here. There you go.